Okay, shall we start? Yes, no enthusiasm here. Shall we start? Yes. <laughs> yes, great. <laughs> uh, so let's keep this up. We want lots of participation and um, endless interruption of the speakers, none of whom is going to talk continuously for more than two and a half minutes, including the Italian. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, these uh, racial okay. prototypes <laughs> die hard. <laughs> so look, I, I'm Rupert Navarro and I'm from IPD in London. We've got a very multinational panel. Um, Andre Cornetti, who is from the FEMIT, the big Italian, now much bigger fund management group. Matthias Thomas, who um, is the chief executive of INREV in Amsterdam, but Prior to that was a professor at the European Business School and the managing director of the IPD business in Germany. Professor Kawaguchi, um, old friend, um, important figure in the Japanese property market where he's a professor, at, professor of finance at Waseda University, a private university, um, but he's got a role similar to um, Carl Werner Schulter in Europe. He's been very important in bringing um, new ideas, um, many of them garnered from outside into the Japanese market. And he's helpful to us when we got going. And he is, for instance, a representative of Argos in Japan and has helped them get going, which has made quite a difference to their software approach to valuation. Andrew Smith, who many of you will know, who has had a long career as a researcher and technician in the property industry and knows analysis very, very well, and is now the, um, quite recently, the um, head of property for a very successful British fund management group, Aberdeen Asset Management, and Philippe Depou from Generali, French office, um, second biggest European insurance company and with investments all over Europe and which are being reformed and put on a, a more modern um, asset managed basis almost as we speak. Um, so we've got representatives from most of the main European countries and from Japan. And I suppose that this question of transparency is extremely topical. Um, as an absolute caricature of the last 10 years, it's perfectly possible to argue that the years between 2002, the end of the financial crisis in Asia, and 2008, the start of the bust in um, Europe, was an era in which um, transparency was not really valued at all. And I remember being asked to go to um, give a speech at a conference in California, the title of the conference being Due Diligence is for Sissies. And Sissies is a very old-fashioned English word, and it refers to, it's an extremely sexist word as well, um, it refers to um, a very female girl child in a girl's school. So somebody who is a sissy is somebody who hasn't got any backbone. And I thought when I was invited to go to this conference that this was um, a first example of American irony. But I discovered it was not ironical at all. It was a statement of fact. And one manager after another got up and said, due diligence is for sissies. You don't need due diligence. Just invest. Go for it. And indeed, for those of us who are interested in measurement, um, precision, um, putting the real estate market on a similar basis to other investment markets, it was a very, very difficult era because people were not interested in um, transparency. And not as a result of that, but for other reasons, the market collapsed. Um, there was a tremendous lack of activity for a long period of time. But there are a lot of signs that the market's coming back. And there's also a lot of signs that despite very different movements, both up and down, that we are approaching a market clearing price which seems to represent a realistic risk <coughs> premium for property at which people are prepared to invest. 
and that level is stabilized at round about 10 to 15 percent below the peak level of the market in 1998. And you know, many guys are not left standing, but the highly respectable group of fund managers at this table who are left standing will all argue that the era ahead has got to be one where there is much greater protection of investors and much greater transparency in the market. And that's what this session is essentially about. And how do we define transparency? Nobody will define it in the same way. But the <coughs> terms that I think are appropriate are something like, can investors know with confidence when they invest in real estate? Um, can they know with confidence what they are buying so that they can avoid making mispriced decisions? And it's an amalgam of um, things to do with um, legalities and research and institutional mainline involvement and market size and honesty that exists in particular markets. <coughs> it's clear also that investors need to know about liquidity and it's clear also that they need to know about their possibilities of getting out of markets. And I think against this background, what we want to discuss now is whether the markets are likely to be more transparent in the years ahead, what factors are promoting it, and whether there is going to be a premium to people who do behave in a transparent fashion. And what we thought we would do collectively when we were discussing this was for each person individually to talk about their own countries. So we'll have a contribution about Italy and about Germany and about Japan and about the United Kingdom and about France along the lines of what's changed now in the offers for um, investments that are being made to what was the situation um, five years ago and um, how um, important the guys working in the investment market um, think that issues to do with um, reporting and better analytics, um, better data actually are. So that'll take the first part of the session. The next part of the session was going to be devoted to regulatory changes, those changes towards Basel III, Solvency II, the official um, regulatory issues, plus accountancy issues, plus control of regulations in the derivative market. So we'll have a second block of discussion about that. And then thirdly, we'll speculate a little bit about the nature of the products that the change in um, investor requirements and the assumed greater transparency they require will mean for the type of um, investment managers and the products they offer that are going to be successful. This is a big agenda to follow. Um, actually, I, I hope it doesn't turn into a series of speeches. And I'd like to encourage people to break in at any time they want. So we won't have a formal question and answer session. It would be good if people can just stand up and question the person who's speaking about what they say. But does that seem all right as a structure for you? We talk a bit about different countries. We talk a bit about the official regulations. Then we talk about the products that are on offer. <coughs> I want a resounding yes. yes. <laughs> and any no's. The ayes have it. We will start with Italy. <laughs> So just a couple of minutes on changes in obvious ways in which Italy property investment okay. is more transparent than it was. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, obviously, uh, the, the broad set of changes um, uh, will have an impact also uh, on Italy as uh, on other, other countries um, with respect to, to previous years. Um, however, uh, from the uh, transparency side, uh, I would say that um, this is not one of the problems that Italy had uh, a few years ago. Uh, Italy uh, in the real estate market uh, has always been transparent and most of the players uh, that uh, um, uh, play uh, an important role in, in this market 
uh, uh, being affected less than probably in other countries. Uh, for example, if we think of the uh, lending market, uh, which obviously uh, had a great impact uh, coming from the uh, change in the set of rules, uh, coming from Basel III and from also Solvency II, but also from you know uh, a global change uh, coming after the crisis. Um, probably Italy has a more uh, resilient banking system with respect to other countries, uh, mainly uh, thanks to uh, um, the, 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 the fact that the system is more traditional. Uh, so it has demonstrated a more uh, solidity, solidity and a great degree of prudence. And um, second, probably second uh, reason is that um, notwithstanding the high uh, government gross debt, I mean, you, you, all, you all know that Italy had a very high gross uh, government debt, the uh, level um, of the, um, the the lower level at the at, at the, um, at the uh, you know family level is is not that high. It's, it's quite low. So uh, particularly uh, if you are thinking about families, uh, so there was a, a a better ability to cope with um, with the credit crunch. Last reason, probably always on, on, on the banking system, is that the Italy banks have showed uh, a, um, a lower exposure to uh, derivatives, um, so less than by, by the end of 2008, um, structured credit instruments uh, were less than 2% of the assets of uh, leading banking groups. So. <coughs> All these factors helped the banking system to better react uh, to the crisis, and that's why probably <coughs> it was not that affected also by the uh, changement of the rules. Matthias, okay. that was a very confident reply, and it doesn't live very easily with the JLL transparency study, in which you are placed 21st on the international list and about worst of the European countries of transparency, the, the JLL accepted transparency index. How do you explain the difference? Well, um, we had um, last year an international study explaining that there was a, uh, Italy is one of, it's not a one of the worst place in terms of transparency. We, we all have you know, other problems in terms of uh, also on real estate. Uh, at, at, at the system level, probably on regulations, probably, uh, but prob prob probably not on the lending uh, side, on the lending market. So uh, it depends on uh, which kind of issue uh, you are looking at. I mean, transparency probably is a it's, it's a word that includes a lot of different issues. So depending on which side you are looking at, it could could have a different uh, effect. On, on the different players. No, no, I was really wanting to address the question of, I must say our perception of Italy from the view of IPD is that it's a very open system where you can get a fair deal and where a proportion of the market is very open, as good as, as, good as any of the other North European markets. And I'm always surprised that the commentaries on Italy make it sound much less transparent about than it probably actually is. A statement. But Germany has the same problem. Well, kind of, uh, I think if we look at the JLL transparency index and at the same time at the corruption index, Germany ranks between rank 5 and rank 12 over the year. So, so kind of, uh, you could argue, well, it's better than rank 21, but there is still room for improvement. Uh, and uh, if you kind of compare the situation today, in Germany to five or ten years ago, clearly there has been, has been an improvement of uh, the quality of data available by the number of information providers and of course of technology kind of uh, enabling access to more data. So, so kind of clearly there has been an improvement um, if you kind of split down uh, kind of transparency into transparency of rental markets and transparency of investment markets. I believe transparency of the 
rental markets in Germany is better um, and uh, that the transparency of uh, the investment market especially have to do or can be improved uh, due to the fact that the level of transactions is still quite low if you compare it to other markets. So, so in essence, it is quite obvious kind of if you have less investment activity going on in a country in a certain period of time, then your information on yields, on returns is, let's say, less robust. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Germany, kind of if you go to the National Statistical Office of Germany, you will find no official statistic on the commercial real estate market, which is kind of a clear shame. And kind of you only find information on the residential market. So, so I think uh, there is kind of uh, well some need to change, uh, some some kind of need uh, for changes in the mindset of uh, the the politicians and administrators in Germany. I'm afraid that you, Professor Kawaguchi, stand below both Italy and Germany in the JLL <laughs> rankings, and you need to justify your case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as you know, that uh, 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 the transparency in Japanese property market is uh, lower than the Italian and German. So, but uh, however, that uh, IPD Japan will increase that uh, uh, more transparency. And uh, after the crisis, that uh, one of the big change. The Japanese government and uh, real, real estate industry uh, has have decided to disclose the data. For example, uh, next month, Tokyo Stock Exchange uh, monthly based transaction uh, housing price index will release every month. So the, this is a big change. So the data provider from that uh, uh, real estate brokerage association uh, will give the, the transaction price data to the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Tokyo Stock Exchange will be provided uh, in the uh, free uh, index for uh, the investor. So we check that the uh, uh, correlation between that uh, uh, housing market price and uh, uh, J lead stock market heavily correlated. So the, this is the one of the uh, uh, change. The second change that uh, uh, we call that uh, traceability. Traceability, uh, uh, that this is a key word after the crisis, uh, this crisis. Uh, so uh, what we learned from this crisis the uh, mispricing and misrating rating is uh, related to the, the ne neglect, neglected risk. So, for example, we check, uh, carefully checked the uh, property risk before the crisis, but uh, we ignore the uh, some risk. So we cannot uh, recognize, uh, recognize before the crisis, but after the crisis, everybody recognizes here is a, there is a risk. So we call the, this is a neglect risk. So the uh, government and uh, uh, property uh, uh, real estate financial sector now try to establish that uh, uh, traceability. Uh, for example, the uh, investor asked me, Professor, where is the risk in this property uh, portfolio? Uh, so uh, we will be able to provide that uh, you can trace the risk uh, from the portfolio to each property and each DCF analysis. Uh, this will be uh, uh, like a relationship between the IPD and Argus and RCA. So the the, uh, the investor and the government uh, uh, need to the uh, uh, more strong relationship between that uh, uh, property index uh, and the DCF uh, uh, analysis and so on. This is what we call traceability. And actually for anybody who's looked at the Japanese REITs market, the regulations surrounding REITs and their information disclosure are actually more strict than in America or Britain or Australia. It's extremely impressive. Quarterly valuations for every property 
lists of the properties and so on. So it's not, not as bad as the common perception. It's a point I want to make about Italy as well, actually. Is the UK as good as you think it is? Well, I think the UK is a, an interesting example of um, a market that, in many ways, it, it is very transparent. I think in terms of price transparency, um, it, it stands out. And I think you can trace the, uh, the movement in the UK market through the crisis, the collapse in values in mid-2007. This, this was a crisis that really began in the US, but the, the pricing reaction in property, in fact, uh, came through in the UK before it came through in the US, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so values collapsed by about 45%. Then there was this very strong uh, rebound starting in 2009, where the market perceived that values had um, overshot on the downside. And so we've seen the benefit coming back uh, as investors have tried to um, take advantage of the yield that they see on offer in UK property. So I suppose the, it's almost a case of be careful what you wish for. If you want transparency, then one of the things that will come with that in terms of pricing is volatility. So the UK has been one of the most volatile markets through the downturn. Uh, certainly if you wanted protection against the downside risk in the crisis, then you would have had better protection in other markets than the UK. Having said that, I think there is a fair degree of evidence that because of um, regular revaluations, usually quarterly, sometimes monthly, we have a, a monthly index in the UK, um, reactions are quite quick. Um, and so marking to market is uh, relatively um, well done, I think, in the UK. Now, has that changed through the crisis? I, I don't think it has particularly. I don't think in terms of pricing transparency much has changed. I think where there have been changes, and this is perhaps something we can pick up in uh, the, the rest of this discussion, is on things like um, the use of debt, whether investors are really getting real estate returns or, or something else, um, and in things like the alignment of fee structures between um, managers and investors. So there certainly have been changes in the UK in those areas, but I think that's uh, rather different. So I suppose I've been rather direct with the other people. Do you think that the leading UK fund managers were as direct as they might have been about the levels of debt that investments were carrying and the levels of fees that managers were charging? I think it's, um, it's one of those things, as the market um, reaches the, the stage that we saw perhaps four and five years ago, where uh, the priority amongst investors was to put money <coughs> quickly into the market. Um, market forces being what they are, um, investors uh, were willing to pay the high fees that managers were demanding. And I said to Rupert over breakfast this morning, one, one of my least accurate predictions in the last years, which I remember very well, was that um, there would be a big squeeze on uh, fees as the market became more competitive, uh, fee levels would be driven <coughs> down uh, across Europe. I made that prediction in the InRev conference, I think, about five years ago. I, I was probably two years too early <coughs> in that process. So I think at the time, um, fee levels were not uh, the highest priority. The use of debt was something, unfortunately, a lot of pension funds in particular, they were changing their rules on the use of debt to permit higher leverage in pension fund investments than would have been the case previously, so that they could take advantage, as they saw it, of uh, risk diversification across different markets. Now, work that we've done at Aberdeen suggests that um, as you add debt, you will always add risk faster than you can diversify it away. And I think that's quite an important lesson to be learnt from that. And I think people are now wiser because of the crisis. Um, doesn't mean to say that some of those mistakes won't be repeated, but I think there is much greater caution now, and I think a, a more open and honest approach between um, managers and investors than there used to be. Thank you. And Philippe, uh, when Philippe said a few words, I'd like to open it to the audience, and if anybody would like to um, address any particular um, national expert on, on these issues. Yes, good morning, every, uh, good afternoon, sorry everybody. Um, <clears throat> regarding France, uh, from a French perspective, uh, I, I, I cannot, uh, I have to compare this crisis, if you call it crisis, to what happened in France in 1990, which is our former very serious crisis in France. And, and from that perspective, in terms of transparency, we are coming from the, the dark night to the, to the very, uh, very sunny day, I must admit. So, uh, uh, although I'm not that old, I have been alive in the real estate business in the two crises. <coughs> and in terms of transparency, it's just a different world. And, and therefore, uh, even though uh, euphoria in a, in a, in a pr 
pre-crisis period like we had in the 19, uh, 2007, for instance, leads to some uh, excesses in terms of transparency. Uh, clearly, uh, France has made a, a huge way uh, on the right side. Um, if we consider just a couple of issues, if you compare these two crises, 1990 and 2008, let's say. Uh, 1990 was a, a financial, economic, and real estate crisis. Certainly not a real estate crisis for 2008, 2009 in France. It, was, it has been, it is, uh, uh, an economical and financial crisis, but not a real estate crisis. Um, it was in, 2000, in 1990, for those who remember, we were a very national country. 2000, uh, 2000, uh, 2008, we are a real international uh, market in France, in real estate. So this makes a big difference because our Anglo-Saxon friends, when they came, they came with transparency mindsets, which was not existing in France. And now we have integrated, I hope, them, not as well as them, but uh, uh, a, a nice way uh, towards where they are. Uh, just to give an example for your, for your sake, IPD was not existing in, in 1990. IPD is a huge institution in France today, and, and no major uh, investor or owner is, is out of IPD today in France. And we all play the game, if I may say. Uh, in, in, in 1990, I was really young. There, was no, there were no due diligence. Follow the rules, not play the game. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In, in, in 1990, there were no due diligence. I mean, I've seen deals done on, on, on a metro ticket. Uh, do you agree? Yes, I agree. How many square meters? What's the rent? Are these offices or not offices? I don't know. And now uh, you cannot conceive any deal, even the smallest one, without a due diligence with all your advisors, with all that. So that force transparency has been a, a huge step, clearly. Um, in, in 1990, we had no REITs or no regulated bodies. Today, we have in France, as you know, les SIC. We have the OPCIs. All these bodies, listed or not listed, are very regulated, and we, we know we have, and this was it quoted before, we have, uh, we have some a, du a duty to, to bring some transparency and information. Um, so I think there has been a huge way on transparency. Now, nothing is perfect. And in, in, as it was said earlier, with less uh, transactions, uh, it's, it's, it's harder to, uh, to, to be uh, transparent. On cl clearly on leases, there, there is an effort to be made. There's no much communication about leases, and particularly what is done on the side of the leases uh, for, for transparency. In terms of sales price, I think it's quite, uh, quite fine. Uh, and I didn't mention, sorry, expertise. Expertise was not compulsory in France in 1990. Today, it's compulsory at least every year for insurance companies. And it is even compulsory four times a year for uh, REITs. So uh, on that way, uh, sorry, uh, last point, last point. Uh, in 1990, in France, you had no management for third parties. You were really doing your business for your own company, insurance company, property dealers, developers, but no fund management, no asset management, etc. Today, it's all like in the Anglo-Saxon countries, we have a lot of sophisticated fund and asset management bodies who have to do some reporting, very uh, precise, very deep to, to their clients. So uh, they need to to feed this reporting for their clients and they cannot <coughs> tell bullshit to their client for years. So uh, they have to bring some real information. That's, maybe it's a little bit lyrical, but uh, it's, it's a huge effort, I can tell you, in France. I think if there's any PhD students present, the study of the way in which France reformed its markets in the early 90s and the impact it had in the last 10 years is an absolute case textbook of big institutional investors working with authorities to produce an open market and the benefits are quite apparent. I think it's a truly extraordinary story actually. Would anybody like to intervene on how far we've got so far about problems to do with open transparent markets in different European countries? Sir, do you mind giving your name? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
you think we can make the same mistakes twice? Matthias. Absolutely. It's in human nature. <laughs> Has anyone got a contrary view? I think we possibly make uh, slightly different mistakes each time. I mean, I think the, um, perhaps the counter to your suggestion would be the extent to which markets are opening up to cross-border investors. And I think that starts to impose uh, a different uh, structure on those markets. So particularly with um, you know, those investors that expect uh, openness and transparency going into more markets where perhaps that isn't the national culture, uh, that starts to uh, impose that sort of discipline. So um, I agree with Matthias that there will be the same mistakes made uh, by the next generation of investors. But uh, I do think that as the market gradually globalizes, and it will be a slow process, I think there's a setback through the, the recession where most investors retrenched back into their home markets, the familiar territory. Um, but certainly our experience is that that's now moving forward again. Um, Cross-border investment is back on the agenda. And I think that does promise um, more general transparency as we go forward. Well, yeah, I agree with you all. I mean, we can always make the same mistakes. But I think that there's another issue to, to point out. We also have to take care uh, and to think if what happened, the, the, the reaction to the crisis is the best reaction that the market could have. In other words, uh, um, we are not sure that all the set of rules that uh, have set up, have set up by uh, international uh, you know, uh, institutions and for, 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 from <coughs> different uh, also countries is really the best reaction that we could have because uh, all these set of rules will bring consequences and, and probably we still don't know if, uh, if some of the consequences uh, could cause some, I would say, damages or uh, you know, collateral effects. I think I want to answer much more optimistically than this, actually. I think it's most unlikely that the rules of the, 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 the lessons from the problems of the last three years have not been learned. Um, you know, on two levels, it's really inconceivable that the big retail banks are going to go on a lending spree like they did in the last 10 years. And, you know, the 1990s property crash was about overdevelopment. Well, they didn't finance too much development this time. They'd learned their, learned their lessons, and I think they'll have learned their lessons about overinvestment this time. I think also it's really inconceivable that um, we'll get another um, boom in securitization of um, loans on secondary properties like we had in the United States, in which to some extent spread into Europe. You know, the regulators did not understand this problem, but now sure as hell they do. So I think it's you know, it's quite possible that we're in for a, a, a much more stable future than we've had. Has anyone else got a question? I think, um, Can you give your name? Oh, sorry, Alice Brahini, Henderson, both investors. Um, I think the point about um, transparency is very important. I think we'll have to improve transparency and quality of data in order for people to increase allocations to real estate, because undoubtedly it's proven to be more volatile now and probably more closely correlated with other asset classes, equities, for example. Um, I think sometimes people are confusing transparency and liquidity, and it tends to be the same markets, you know, one is the, the more transparent being the more liquid. But the case of France, for example, it's a market that I would perceive to be transparent enough for us to want to increase exposure, but not liquid enough for us to actually be able to gain access. And lack of liquidity is what makes the market less volatile and probably more defensive. Um, and I, don't, I, I can't see quite how that, how that might change because that's very much tied up in the ownership structure in these markets. Are you making a nationalistic point or a market point? <laughs> it's a market point rather than... <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur de Pou. <laughs> France, sure. is a, is a, France, I think, is a good example of... Um, yeah, I quite agree. I mean, transparency and liquidity are not in the same pocket. Uh, liquidity of a market is, uh, is, 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 it comes from its own size, the appetites that people have on this market. As far as I know, France is quite appealing to investors because it's quite a mature market. But uh, as you all know in this room, uh, real estate is not replicable. So replicable sorry. So when everybody flies out from the stock exchange to uh, to real estate and everybody on the flight to quality core uh, business, 
uh, when there's one building for sale, there is uh, 20 buyers. So liquidity to get out is good. Liquidity to get in is hard. Uh, but I think there has been some uh, improvements in liquidity in France since precisely we had this uh, SIC regime and the OPCIs, which, are, which is now basically the same, but which is not listed, but gives access to uh, more actors to more products, if I may say. But, but to, uh, generally, France is, uh, I mean, pr about 12% uh, of our assets are in, uh, in, in REITs in France, in, in SIC, and I can clearly tell you they're not liquid. Uh, they're not liquid to get in, and they're not liquid to get out. So there's no uh, ideal uh, system, and I agree. I mean, it's nothing, it's hardly nothing to see with transparency. One more. So I've got two more. So make them both brief questions, then we'll move on. Yes, uh, Travis Munt, Columbia University. Uh, in the States, we've been seeing a lot of pushback against the reporting and regulation to the point that the SEC is even saying they're not going to enforce portions of the Dodd-Frank Act and so forth. And I was wondering, in, in Europe, do you see, the, the panelists see, uh, the European market as being more receptive to reporting and regulation than the United States is, and if so, why? And this is a specific point about real estate funds as opposed to in funds in non-listed funds in other markets? Yes, sir. Yeah. <coughs> I, I think Andrew and Mr. Cornetti would be best to answer this. Well, if I can perhaps have a go at that, I mean, I think um, the, the title of this session has the juxtaposition of uh, making a better market and regulation. I'm not sure that the, the two ideas normally go together. So I, I think, no, the Europeans are, are not particularly receptive to, to extra regulation. I think certainly our experience um, across international markets is that there's a lot of the wrong kinds of in uncertainty introduced by some of the regulatory proposals at the moment. So investors like uncertainty, but they like market uncertainty because that's how you make money. Um, one of the difficulties that we have at the moment is that there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty. You've got different kinds of regulation. A large part of it has been designed for things like hedge funds, not for real estate funds. And so um, one of the, th the struggles that we have at the moment, and I know INREV is very uh, actively looking at these sorts of things, is that legislation and regulation designed for other markets <coughs> is catching real estate funds. Um, a number of unintended consequences of that. And, and that's actually preventing investors doing what in many cases they want to do. We, we have an example in Norway, which is outside the European Union, um, but regulatory proposals there that are, are really not well conceived for property that's really preventing anybody investing in Norwegian property funds at the moment. So I think that kind of uncertainty can be deeply unhelpful. Um, and one of the challenges as an industry that we face is that um, we don't speak with one voice and it is sometimes quite difficult to uh, counter some of these unintended consequences that we see. So that's a challenge and I, I don't think that the Europeans are um, more receptive. Um, we have a, a lot of regulation facing us at the moment. It's, it is a big challenge. I'm sorry, this is a very, very interesting question and we could debate it for half an hour but I think I'm going to have to. There's one other over there, just quickly. Some of the sorry yields on some of the primer stuff is now back to levels where it was pre the crisis. Are those yields sustainable? Uh, they've got to those levels because of the, the huge inflows of overseas capital into certain parts of the markets. So it's really the risk of certain parts of the market becoming overpriced. This is slightly off the subject of the. Do you know Phil? I'm going to come back to that at the end because I think we want to talk about transparency rather than the levels of market prices. Is that all right for everybody? Just the time the microphone reached this gentleman. Just shout. Regarding reg 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 regulations, don't forget that we have the local regulation, country regulation, plus European regulation. And I can tell you in many fields it's a nightmare because they don't, f they don't match each other and they are probably sometimes contradictory. Mr. Uh, Armas, I came from South America, developer. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Smith. You, talk, you spoke about fees. There's a transparency or, or something right about this fees? It's, uh, because in South America, there's no any regulation about fees of the developers. 
So whenever you have a good project, you just uh, try to, to put the, the fee the higher that you can. But that's no any regulation, even with the pension funds. How do you keep developers in control? <laughs> <laughs> That's always a challenging thing to do. I think the, the fund management fees, to a large extent, are set by the market. They're not set by regulation. And certainly, I would argue that's the way it should be. But in, in a market as competitive as, as Europe, um, there is plenty of competition. Now, I think what's happened is that with the crisis, there's been a lot more focus on what makes sense for investors. So uh, setting remuneration that's genuinely linked to the underlying property returns, not uh, linked to the amount of debt you put on the fund, there would be clear, clearly a misalignment of interest. Um, Performance-related fees, the, the threshold for the performance fees should be appropriate to the risk profile of the fund. Again, that wasn't necessarily the case in the past. I think there's a much greater focus on that now. Um, removal of things like subscription fees, paying for the privilege of going into somebody's fund. Uh, transaction fees being remunerated for turning over stock, not necessarily um, aligned with the interests of the investors. So that there are all sorts of things which I think have been problematic, and I think quite rightly those have been thrown into, into focus by the, the downturn. Uh, I think it's the competitive environment that's, that's helping to keep the focus on doing the right thing for investors. I think this is a very, very interesting question, and I think that the question of transparency um, of development profits, development returns, needs to get pushed far higher up the agenda if there's going to be a return to significant levels of development. It's just a, a market which is completely non-transparent at present. And I know at IPD we're thinking very, very hard about ways in which we can produce historical series of development returns which can help fund managers invest with confidence in this area. Look, I think if we sh can, we should move on to the regulatory issues. and actually we're running a bit out of time and I think I might just ask um, Matthias to talk a little bit about the regulatory issues affecting the market and perhaps and um, Philippe about the uh, situation in France and um, Francisco Gucci about the Japanese situation. Okay. Um, on, on behalf of INREF, kind of our focus uh, in the next years will be Solvency 2, clearly kind of the treatment of property with the 25% market shock, uh, which we believe is uh, kind of leading to a preferential treatment of government bonds, which are not subject of a treatment uh, to a market shock. So kind of uh, the, well, the question is, is that an intended or an unintended consequence to refinance government debt? I don't know, but certainly <coughs> kind of it will, kind of if it stays as it is, it will kind of lead to a huge reallocation of capital from real estate into uh, the bond market. And the question is, if that is in the interests of a life insurance policy holder um, or kind of... Uh, a retiree uh, for, for a pension fund or insurance company to be heavily uh, invested in the bonds if uh, you expect kind of higher inflationary trends in the future. So uh, this is uh, one area where kind of we are currently in uh, good discussions with uh, various regulators uh, from the European Commission to the um, Econ Secretariat to the um, uh, Life Insurance to the European Life Insurance uh, Supervisory uh, Board AOPA in Frankfurt. Uh, second thing we are focusing on is AIFMD, the Alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive, where unfortunately property funds have been included um, in this area and kind of. Uh, um, to, to a large extent, kind of, uh, new rules have uh, been developed, which uh, in essence uh, are going to reduce uh, the level of returns which will be available uh, for investors because somebody has to bear the cost for having a custodian uh, as an additional level of uh, safety implemented. Uh, the third uh, point where we're looking into is uh, AMIR or the Derivatives Directive which uh, will require 
um, uh, a central counterparty uh, for a, a derivatives direct uh, transaction and clearly kind of this this will lead to um, kind of huge kind of a uh, huge kind of business risk for fund managers if all of a sudden collateral for an OTC tr uh, needs to be uh, posted in cash instead of kind of by pledging real estate so so kind of this will kind of uh, change the uh, pattern of returns uh, due to the uh, well kind of assuming that uh, fund managers are still interested in hedging away currency risk or hedging away interest rate risk this will clearly change the pattern of return because the level of liquidity will increase so kind of these three uh, action points of uh, regulations. Unfortunately, they're more or less coming at the same time. So, kind of, uh, I think, kind of, a lot of people in fund managers organizations are kind of now looking into well, how can we adapt our organizational structure? Uh, kind of, who is going to be the person talking to a national regulator? Who is going to be the person talking to a European regulator? So, so in addition to to the, these increased requirements, of course, there there is an organizational change uh, going on, which will kind of reshape the face of the industry. So uh, there there are kind of definitely concerns out there as a consequence of uh, the kind of in general acceptable uh, principle of solvency to making life insurers more secure. Uh, there is nothing against that, but uh, I think in detail. Uh, we need to refine bits and pieces. And these are highly technical arguments at a European scale which need really good representation. Um, if, well, kind of the, the, well w within this level of bad news, uh, the good news is that uh, I think for the first time uh, on Solvency II, various national and international industry bodies have uh, joined forces uh, in order to kind of speak as with with one voice to regulators. So, so kind of uh, uh, this this definitely is a very positive development. Yeah, I think it's a very very important issue for the real estate industry and the quantity of investment that's going to be able to take place and the sorting out the data. Um, extremely difficult in some cases is a very important issue which us and the major agents need to work on. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, first sorry. Gucci, I, I'm very, very sorry. <coughs> Just a little bit about... Uh, yes. So, uh, 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 I carried out a study that uh, if there was a bubble in the uh, real estate market uh, in 2000, uh, at, uh, during that uh, US housing bubble uh, era, so my conclusion, there was no bubble in the real estate market because the uh, financial service agency uh, prohibited the Japanese bank to lend money to real estate in the uh, uh, spring of 2007. So they uh, restricted the uh, money to uh, real estate. So the if uh, there were no uh, Lehman shock, maybe uh, Japanese uh, uh, property price uh, 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 went down without uh, this crisis because that the uh, uh, government uh, uh, kept that uh, uh, lending money to real estate. So this is uh, the government, Japan's government land from the previous 20 years ago bubble burst. Now, the, we have a too strong regulation. This regulation uh, killed the animal spirit of Japan. The result, the Japanese economy uh, has been collapsed to 20 years. So the, uh, uh, this is the one thing. And the second thing that the, uh, now we are talking about that the situation that after the 2018, the Basel III, will be completed in 2018. So after the Basel III, it is difficult to make a profit from the real estate lending or real estate investment. 
because uh, Basel III uh, make us uh, to de risk, de risk, uh, de risk uh, investment uh, regulatory. It is difficult to uh, stimulate the economy based on the uh, property. So we are uh, now uh, arguing that before the Basel III, we must make a profit. It is difficult to get after the uh, Basel III. Is there anybody who is still concerned that the state of European economies looks increasingly like the state of the Japanese economy in the early 1990s? Because Kawaguchi is a real expert at this, actually, and it's a very, very important topic. We could get ourselves in a liquidity trap. We could face deflation. We are all full of optimism here. <laughs> <laughs> Blindness or complacency are the other ones. <laughs> yes, of course, I am representing an insurance company. So uh, as you can imagine, Solvency 2 is, is, is a big issue. It, it sucks us a lot of time and, and efforts and energy to, uh, to tackle this issue, which is still rather unknown. It's not definitive. Uh, a few words on that. Um, first thing is that I think the uh, the uh, it's it's quite recent that on, on an international point of view, as Martin mentioned, the, the prise de conscience and how you say that, so the, uh, uh, the the fact that people are start to think to be concerned about that uh, issue is rather recent, and, and probably lobbying and international uh, action starts now, and I think it's it's. It's better than never, but uh, it's time. Second issue is that uh, as far as we, as we know for the moment, at least in my experience of generally, is that as far as real estate is concerned, this, would, this will lead us to direct property. So uh, we are insurance companies, so we do generally uh, direct investment uh, uh, with equity. We don't, we don't use much uh, uh, leverage. But I can tell you that Solvency 2 leads us really to do direct equity, and, and well, which is fine. I mean, we've been doing that. But what is more important maybe is that it's not that sexy now to go into the REITs. And uh, we are one of the most important investors of the REITs. So this, if things doesn't change, it could bring the insurance company to get out partially uh, from the, the REITs uh, uh, stakes, which, which would be a bomb in the market. And, uh, and not to talk about indirect leverage uh, non-listed companies, which is basically the worst case where probably the, the shock is the double, uh, about 50% request of equity in front of, a, of, of your investment. So this is the end also of some very specific kind of uh, investment we, we've, been, we've been doing. Uh, probably two, two positive impacts uh, of the, the solvency, uh, solvency issue. First thing, it seems e obvious, but it ne needs to be said. It, it, it brings us to know our own risk much better than we used to know them because we've been forced to do so. We've been forced in, inside our companies to analyze our risk ourselves or with the help of in-house or external experts. So analyze our risk, identify them, make a diagnostic, and then, of course, put a process in place to, to bring these risks down. There's no zero risk uh, business in real estate, but let me tell you that even if in a very structured way, a uh, uh, company like ours, we, we've, we've been <coughs> more conscious about the, the risk and the way to treat them. Second issue is probably something maybe uh, quite usual in Anglo-Saxon countries, but not that much in, I think, Latin countries, is the coming from a risk return analysis to a risk return uh, um, uh, equity requested which is the third three-dimension analysis of our investment, which changed a lot of things uh, instead of the two-dimension risk return. That's, that's basically it. Again, I think this is a very, very important issue. Does anybody, yes, gentlemen here. Thank you, uh, Stephen Herring with uh, BDO in London. Um, just picking up the, the answer to the last um, question. I mean, obviously, uh, I agree that there's no such thing as a risk-free investment in anything, even maybe U.S. Treasury <laughs> bonds. Um, 
having said that, there are ways where you can take huge amounts of risks out of real estate and make it virtually risk-free. Uh, for example, a closed-ended fund which had no borrowings and was exposed only to rental levels and occupancy, okay, it might vary a little bit. Maybe, you know, there's a question of capital growth. But I think there's a lot of investors who would be very attractive, attracted to um, a real estate fund with no borrowings where that they just got a share of the rental incomes, less some administration costs and trusted the managers to pick the right properties without the, the levels of leverage and gearing that we all became addicted Look, to you. in the last decade. Thank you. That's a good question and it actually leads very nicely on to the last point of the agenda, which we're going to have to be quite quick on. Um, the balance between opportunistic and core investing between using debt as leverage of return and being debt free, um, is it real? Is it going to make an impact on the way you offer your products to the investors you want to be your clients? Well, I guess um, obviously, I mean, the, 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 there is going to be an impact. I mean, I agree with what you said. Um, so, I, generally speaking, the, the, the market uh, is reacting, trying to propose uh, a big to basics uh, approach. Um, but, I mean, I would like to add also other, other consequences in terms of products. Uh, because I think there will be also, um, uh, you know, some good opportunities for the investors coming from, uh, I would say, distressed assets, for example, coming from the banks, or, or, or maybe on the impacts that the uh, regulations uh, will have also, not only in the banks, but also on the insurance companies, as um, uh, we were uh, listening before. Uh, so the this set of rules will uh, obviously change uh, um, the attitude of, of the uh, main players of the market in proposing new products and on the other side on the attitude of the investors and on the other place so banks and insurance companies <coughs> probably are the most important ones uh, about the insurance companies what I would like just to add I hope you agree <laughs> with me that there is an impact uh, coming from the new set of rules uh, from especially solvency too, uh, but this could cause also a, a sort of, um, a, 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 well, an increase of the loans pricing and a repricing of the real estate industry, which could have also a sort of boomerang effect on, on the ratios of the insurance companies and, and the banks. So uh, and this, together with what you were saying before, could cause, could cause a, a shock on the asset management um, market with uh, and, you know assets going on the market so causing uh, good opportunities but an imbalance of the market in our investment intention survey can we clearly kind of see a tendency uh, still towards core funds and value added funds clearly no opportunity funds uh, at the same time we see that uh, especially large investors are now favoring different structures, especially kind of joint venture structures and club deal-like structures in order to kind of avoid uh, perceived or not perceived misalignment of interest between fund managers and investors. And kind of clear statement uh, leverage, it is kind of the uh, most important, most relevant risk factor uh, when it, investing especially via a fund so uh, the reduction of, of leverage deleveraging uh, of course is uh, one of the consequences uh, of the uh, financial crisis for the last two years professor Kaguchi, do you want to say anything about i guess it's been very difficult for foreigners to invest in japan in a non-opportunistic environment is this now changing Yes, after the crisis. So the, after the crisis, uh, the, the, the one of the changing that uh, <coughs> I call that the uh, green fund. This is a synergy fund. The synergy means that the combination of the Chinese property and Japanese property. So the GIC uh, uh, has been that the IPO, 
such kind of uh, uh, fund uh, as a Singapore REIT in the Singapore stock market. The price about three billion US dollar. If we, if they uh, IPO in uh, Tokyo stock exchange market, maybe that the, uh, the price is less than the three billion US dollar. So they gather that the 10 times of the money of the, this kind of uh, uh, the IPO amount. So now that the many uh, investor prefer to the synergy fund, uh, <laughs> the combination of the uh, very stable uh, real estate, uh, property in Japan and uh, very gross uh, expectation from the uh, chi China property. Maybe that uh, in Europe, uh, this kind of synergy fund will be workable. For example, that uh, synergy with European property with uh, Chinese property. The, the, it is a very interesting, very exciting for uh, this year or next year. This is a, a, a big change in Japan. Well, 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 there are lots of possibilities. Um, Britain and Ireland, Spain and Portugal. <laughs> Lovely. Well, maybe just coming back to the, the point you made, I think that absolutely there's been a shift um, in favour of low-risk vehicles. So low-risk tenants, low-risk strategies, no debt. Um, what it does mean, I think, is that a lot of people are chasing exactly the same thing. And that in itself will open up opportunities for other, uh, other strategies. So perhaps more secondary property, but not necessarily with debt. And I think that's perhaps the the difference, that there is an aversion to, to just using debt as of, as of right, almost. Um, investors, I think, will be much more selective. The, the other thing which I think there is a, a complete paradox is, of course, now people are taking debt out of funds, and really the time to do that is in the run-up to a downturn. Um, now is the time you should be putting debt into funds to take the benefit of the upturn. Now, that's not what's happening. So it, it's quite a paradoxical situation, but I think a natural reaction to the, um, the bad experiences through the downturn. I think it's the end of the conference. So just uh, two, two points which are not mentioned regarding that uh, new environment for investment, for sure. I will not insist on the core. Uh, aspect and no, as you mentioned, this gentleman mentioned uh, no risk, although even in a core fund, it's a no risk does not exist. I mean, you can be wrong in investment, uh, the building can be a uh, core, but uh, uh, in a few years' time, it can be at the wrong location or, or wrong transport or wrong something, and then there is a risk still. Anyway, but uh, two, two issues there uh, um, core, yes, but two issues which make things different than before is probably the green issues. Because uh, where we were in the former crisis, uh, you had uh, stock and then you had to transform this stock. But today it's different because even your own buildings, they are not green as they should be. Uh, talking about France and legislation on green issues, but which are applying to many countries. And uh, we have to, to invest also in our own portfolios in order to bring our buildings inside the green regulation. And uh, it's, it's not a joke. Huh? Uh, I hope everybody is conscious of that. Uh, and second point is more positive is that uh, I think personally that it's time to go back for risk uh, on a very special risk. It's new buildings. Uh, I, as I said at the beginning of the conference, I consider, at least for France, that it's not a real estate crisis. There is no oversupply. And what happened is that because the banks have learned the lessons from the previous crisis, they've stopped also lending to development deals. And therefore, there is a shortage of certain kind of buildings in certain kind of locations. And, uh, and I think it's the right time to start again as investors to go into that brand new buildings adapted to the new demand, green of course, and if possible, well located. No, it's a very, very interesting point this, but only, <coughs> only if development becomes a transparent market. I just, let's have one final round of questions before we wind up. Hi, this is Christian Axelsen from Greek Investors in Norway. I, I just wanted to comment the earlier comment. I thought it was a bit strange that just because you have a closed-ended fund without, without leverage, there's no risk. Is that just because the manager doesn't want to report the fluctuation of the prices? Because I believe the risk is there anyhow. 
Um, we have always been looking for no leverage or low leverage funds out there in the European markets especially because we don't understand why can't investors take their own leverage on it and the real estate manager find the real estate and do that job and not the leverage job. I think the gauntlet has been thrown at you actually. I, I don't want, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to answer it from your side, but I mean, uh, obviously, I, I agree uh, to what Mr. Depo was saying. I mean, there are always a risk, but I also agree on the fact that in certain type of investment, the, the risk is very low. Obviously, uh, if you're investing in a closed end fund with no leverage, you always have a risk of gaining less of what you could gain in investing some in something else. Uh, but I mean, uh, there is a there is a there is a difference uh, according to which kind of investment you are following, uh, which causes different effects on your you know risk approach uh, on the market. So it's not everything the same. No, thank you for that question. I think I'm going to be garroted by this shape of the signal coming from the MIFIM organizers at the back of the room, unless I bring this to a close. But thank you very, very much indeed, especially the panel, but you for being an attentive audience. I think we've had a, a quite rich discussion. Transparency <coughs> is not just important, it's essential. Pleased with um, Philippe's contribution, you need a good trust advisor, you must take account of environmental factors. This question about um, development and making it an accepted part of the process through greater transparency and data seems to me to be a very, very good one. Um, the question about regulation and its extreme importance and getting behind your industry body and arguing the case, it's going to come, but we want to make it as good as we can and fair and reasonable. Um, it's absolutely clear that we're going back to um, an equity bias. I think it's a question as to who's going to run the equity. Um, I'm old enough to remember a real estate industry when there were no funds. It's, funds were really invented in about 1993. Before that, people invested directly and there were very few mutual investment funds. Um, anyway, these are important changes and thank you for listening to us and thank you for your contribution.